In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I have a cotton candy problem. It's supposed to make you feel better to say it out loud in front of other people, but you're laughing and that makes me feel worse. Of course, compared to most problems, this one is very small, at least on the surface. Still a grown man, and a priest no less, whose discipline melts at the sight of cotton candy. That's a shame. But it started early. Every year, Adairville hosted the Strawberry Festival. Now, most of the kids blew their money on tickets to ride the Ferris wheel or uh, the carousel, or they, they played those carnival games you can never win. But the object of my fascination was this magical machine sitting at the corner of the fire station, turning out these gossamer threads of pure sugar. In our house, nobody asks who ate my cotton candy. They just come to me and ask, why did you eat my cotton candy? But there's something worse. This problem, like so many, serves as a symbol of an issue hidden much deeper, far beneath the pink fluff. And while most of you may be free of the urge to devour any cotton candy in sight, I suspect that more of us have this underlying problem than any of us would like to admit. It manifests on the surface in many ways, craving money, power, popularity, the desperate desire to be accepted even if we have to sacrifice our principles and integrity, the endless quest to feel secure from all danger, no matter what that takes from us. And all of those obsessions and compulsions arise from a single root. Most of us, maybe all of us to some extent, really like the taste and the buzz of cotton candy Christianity. Take, for instance, worship. Some of us like to look down our nose at people who flock to places that offer what we derisively call entertaining worship, where the pounding drums sends your pulse rate higher and encouraging words set your heart on fire. But if the crowd that comes here on Easter Day decided to pick a fight with the people who show up on Good Friday, that Good Friday crew would be smart to send out peace feelers quick because they'd be, out, be outnumbered by more than three to one. Worse off than the king in the parable who only had to deal with a two to one disadvantage. Now I'm not complaining or criticizing because I have no right. I've got a cotton candy problem of both varieties. And it's perfectly understandable. How can the bitterness of dour penitence and gruesome death compete with the thrilling joys of resurrection. Of course you do need a dead person before you can find an empty tomb that means anything, but chomping down on the ears of a chocolate at Easter Bunny is far preferable to dealing with the crucified corpse for a few hours. There's a host of problems with cotton candy Christianity. It is insubstantial, just melts in your mouth, and before you know it, all that sweetness is gone. The rush, the high does not last long, and once it's over, guess what? Gravity works. But most of all, Jesus will not stand for it because he is a man on the move without the time to spend out a fuzzy pink cloud of sugar for us. And if our faith diet consists mostly of cotton candy, we will be too weak and unenergetic to follow Jesus very far. He made that plain enough when he turned to the large crowds following him and said some rather astonishing and disturbing things. You would think he would have felt pretty good to look behind him and see this dust cloud kicked up by that many feet with people hanging on his every word eagerly awaiting his next miracle. But that was the problem. Most people were following Jesus for the goodies. And very few had a clue where this was going to wind up. 
They didn't want to know. And if there's anything that human beings are really good at, it is staying ignorant of things we do not want to know. So Jesus laid it out for them without a single crystal of sugar coating. You must hate your family. You must bear the cross. You must count the cost and give up all your possessions. If these factors have not entered into your calculations, then that strong tower of faith you want to build is going to wind up as a patio. And when the tough times come, you will make the wrong call and lose it all like an outnumbered king unwilling to face the fact that he has already been beaten before the battle's begun. That's some stern stuff. And we recoil from it. I imagine after that short speech, the crowd following Jesus got a lot smaller in a very short span of time. Hate my family? He just told us to love my enemy. Bear the cross? I don't want to be executed, and why should I be? Count the cost? But we thought grace was free. And if Dietrich Bonhoeffer had been there, he would have said, yes, grace is free, but it is not cheap. Surrender everything we own. What will we eat? Where will we sleep? Jesus wasn't being mean or trying to turn people off. It was a reality check. Do you really want to do this? Are you prepared to accept the consequences? What are you ready to let go of to see this journey with me through to the very end? Those are hard but compassionate questions that need to be asked and that need to be answered by anyone who wants to follow Jesus. Now, does this mean that to be a good disciple I have to despise Stephanie and Ben and Emma? I don't think so, and neither do Alan Culpepper and Fred Craddock, two scholars who have forgotten more about the Bible than I will ever know. Craddock writes, to hate is a Semitic expression meaning to turn away from, to detach oneself from. That's not the emotional rage we think of when we hear the word hate. Culpepper chimes in, hate indicates that if there is a conflict, the demands of Christian discipleship must take precedence. And Craddock adds that the gospel not only takes precedence, but in fact redefines the others. And the others that he refers to is all of our other relationships. Jesus is saying that to follow him, our relationships must and will change, because following him will change us our perspective, our priorities, our pattern of life. All of it gets transformed when our primary relationship is with Jesus, when no one else in our lives matters more to us than him. Being a faithful disciple needs to mean more to us than what we think of as being a good child or spouse or parent. And by being a faithful disciple, we become better children and spouses and parents. Even though it may not feel like it at the time when we make that sacrifice. When we have to share with those we love, I need to say yes to Jesus. So on this, I need to say no to you. It is not easy. But very little in life that is truly worthwhile ever is. We need to take careful stock and discern if we actually own our possessions or if we are possessed by them, demon style. If you can't let go of something that you ostensibly own, then it's got a pretty solid grip on you. So who is really the owner? I encountered this when I purged my library. 
you have no idea the pride of the 62 books that I took down to goodwill. It was a painful process, shamefully so. But does this mean that any of us have to give it all away? Well, not necessarily. In fact, very rarely. But if Jesus were to ask that of any one of us, which path do we choose? The path of faith sees that what once seemed essential is disposable. Faith parts with mere things with freedom and joy. But it's more than just stuff that we need to be ready to let go of. Dropping an object like a book and walking away is child's play compared to what we really want. And what we really want is to keep a tight grip on our lives. We want to be in control. We want to possess godlike powers to obtain the outcomes we desire. In fact, this is the root of sin. The apple in the Garden of Eden, the serpent said, will make you like God. And that's what Jesus means when he speaks of hating even life itself, when he demands that his disciples carry the cross. Now, let's be very clear. Hating your life does not involve self-loathing or shame. Are we clear on that, at least up here, maybe if not down here quite yet? Hating your life involves recognizing that our attempts to jerry-rig the outcomes we desire are mostly a waste of time and energy that lead us to disappointment and frustration and resentment. It's about waking up to the fact that when we think we've managed to take control of our lives, that's mostly an illusion, an escapist sort of fantasy world. What we can control is our choice to carry a cross or not, to be a faithful disciple or not. And nothing shatters the illusion that we're in control better than the weight of a cross on our shoulders. To carry the cross is an act of submission and obedience to Jesus. And under its weight, ironically, we are freed released from captivity, from our quest for control, released for a life of humble and selfless service. When we carry the cross, we get a little glimpse of what he suffered for our sake, and gratitude just wells up and pours forth from our hearts with gifts of grace for others. Mercy, forgiveness, peace. And the more we share those gifts of grace with others, the more liberated we become. And through what we suffer for the sake of the gospel, we are made whole. We're healed and reborn into a new life through the resurrection of Jesus. This is what we have. This is what we've been given to offer to the world. A cross, not cotton candy. A promise, not a problem. But we cannot share with others what we ourselves will not accept. And we need to be honest with people like Jesus was. People need to know that being a disciple is hard. And when we are truthful, do not expect a horde of people to break down those doors over there, but pray for it. As we all strive to become more faithful disciples, do not expect perfection from yourself, but pray that God will lead us all to greater perfection by His grace. But it's probably best not to expect anything but to hope with faith that in our lives and in our world, God's will be done.